The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today um, for the development and use of the Virginia Brain Injury Screening Tool webinar. My name is Deborah Holloway. I'm the Education and Resource Coordinator at the Brain Injury Association of Virginia. And we are a nonprofit statewide organization, and we really focus on advancing of education awareness, support, treatment, research, and to improve the quality of life for all people affected by brain injury. I wanted to let you know this webinar is supported by a grant from the Administration for Community Living, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and a state contract administered by the Virginia Department for Aging and Rehab Services. We will be recording today's webinar, and it will be available along with a copy of today's PowerPoint on our website, hopefully the end of this week. Um, so that's biav.net. You are able to ask questions throughout the presentation, and um, Dr. Broshek will be able to take some of those questions at the end of her presentation. If for some reason she's not able to get to your question, we will be able to get back to you with a response. If you're interested in a certificate of attendance, you can download that under the handouts tab to the right of your screen. So I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. Dr. Donna Broshek is the John Edward Fowler Professor at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. She is a board certified, she's board certified in clinical neuropsychology. Her primary appointment is in the Department of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences, where she's director of a neurocognitive assessment lab and chief of psychological services. She's also co-director of the multidisciplinary acute concussion evaluation clinic and is one of the key leads for concussion and brain injury research within the Brain Injury Institute at UVA. Um, Dr. Broshek, thank you. Thank you so much, Deb, and uh, I really want to express my appreciation to Deb Holloway and the Brain, Institu uh, brain uh, Injury Association of Virginia, who um, I'm very big fans of all the good work they do for um, our uh, fellow citizens that have um, challenges with brain injury. So thank you all for joining us today, and I'm going to tell you about a project that we've been working on, and I did want to mention, um, there we go, that um, with this project was funded by uh, the Commonwealth Neurotrauma Initiative Trust Fund, and it was managed by DARS. Um, however, the contents and the results and everything I'm going to talk about are the sole responsibility of myself and Dr. Barth and do not necessarily represent the official views of the CNI Trust Fund or DARS. And so I do want to give a big shout out to uh, my mentor, friend, and colleague, Dr. Jeff Barth, who some of you know. Um, he was my uh, collaborator and co-author on this project. And I also want to particularly thank Patricia Goodall, Patty Goodall, and Donna Cantrell of DARS, who answered many, many questions um, for us and worked with us very closely in conducting this project. So what I really want to emphasize is that this is a project that really came out of the request of DARS because they really wanted a better way to get a sense of citizens in Virginia who might have issues related to traumatic brain injury or acquired brain injury. And so we really developed this project to try to, to help them with that. And so one of the things that I think is really important is to really think about the public health responsibility of screening for TBI. And it's particularly important when the injury results in continuing symptoms that may affect productivity, community integration, and other social problems. And it's really important to realize that the, having a history of TBI is rarely asked about in primary care or other health service settings or even in educational settings. And for those of us who work very closely with individuals with brain injury, we may not think about this, but if you step outside um, you know, roles of people who, who work with individuals frequently, it often just doesn't even enter people's minds to ask about this. And if these symptoms um, are not really identified or um, the history is not reported, some of those symptoms may be inappropriately attributed to other problems, such as just aging or depression, learning or emotional difficulties, or sometimes just poor motivation or not being cooperative or things like that, when in fact it may have a more of a neurologic basis. 
And so um, this is a quote from a, an article on um, TBI screening and the importance of it for public health. And it also emphasizes that failing to recognize the cause of these symptoms precludes appropriate treatment or symptom management. And um, DARS is very invested, as is BIAV, in identifying citizens who may need um, specific resources um, given their individual history. So what our goals were was to um, try to identify or develop a TBI or ABI screening measure. And the goal was to help the community health service agencies in Virginia identify clients who have a self-reported history of TBI or ABI and to provide some information if that history might be contributing to some current challenges and also to provide some information and resources for staff to provide to those identified clients. So what should a measure look like? Well, given that most of the community agencies in Virginia uh, see a very high volume of patients and they typically um, have very high caseloads, it was made very, very clear to us and it was our goal that it be very brief, easy to administer, it should not require extensive training, and it should provide some information about whether there's a history of TBI, ABI, some kind of information about the severity, um, current symptoms related to the TBI, ABI, and then um, with an end goal of providing some general information that could potentially guide referral. So the scope of our work, it was a three-year project, and we started by um, initiating a formal literature review because we really wanted to identify screening tools um, already in existence to see if some of those might be appropriate. Um, and if, if we did not find such measures, we had agreed to develop one. And then we also wanted to develop some resources for non-brain injury professionals on how to implement a brain injury screening protocol. So we started with a literature review, as all academics do. And um, as you can see, we started with um, really just kind of looking at brain injury citations and trying to identify um, particularly tools that had been used for mass screening. Um, and as we went through, you can see there was just a very large number of citations. But when we combined brain injury, TBI, or ABI, and mass screening, uh, we only identified, um, we found 136 articles, which then when we looked through those, we kind of came up with 12 articles um, that were specifically relevant to this project, which we um, reviewed. We then also were fortunate to find a list of um, screening instruments used in various states um, as part of various brain injury initiatives. And so we reviewed those as well. And this um, screen shows you um, a total, we found a total of 26 different instruments that we reviewed and evaluated. And what we did is we really looked at a variety of different um, aspects of each injury. So we, you know, the source who developed it, whether it was just TBI um, or just ABI or whether it covered both areas. And then we looked at whether it was a checklist, more of an interview format, uh, a mental status type exam or a neuropsychological screening measure. We looked at the number of items, the intended population, how long it took to give it, and then any, any published advantages and disadvantages. And again, our goal was to find something that was very succinct, very brief and very easy to use for um, professionals um, providing services um, that were not brain injury professionals. So this is just a, um, a list of the various measures that we reviewed and you can see they're incredibly variable from sort of mental status exams like an MMSE or a MOCA to much more comprehensive um, in-depth evaluations. Um, but in looking through all these, we found two that were the most widely cited from our perspective and that really um, have a lot of um, published um, expertise. And so we really reviewed these in depth. And one of the Ohio State University TBI identification method, and this was very specific to TBI, and it was in an interview form. And it, 20 to 30 minutes to administer, and we knew that would not um, go well with our very busy community agencies. It also kind of drilled down, so if individuals had multiple um, uh, injuries, multiple TBIs, it kind of drilled down into the details of each one. 
um, so it could potentially be even longer. We also looked at um, the brain injury screening questionnaire produced um, at Wayne State University, which is listed as a 10 to 15 minute in administration, um, and it can be either administered verbally or by computer. But in looking at it, it actually, it seemed to us that it would take much longer. It provided a lot of detail about each injury. Uh, and both of these measures are exceptional. Um, they have many, many advantages. They provide a lot of very rich clinical detail. But in, in uh, our perspective, these were just too unwieldy for use by um, service providers who do not have a brain injury background because there's a level of clinical detail that these measures went into. So what we decided is that uh, we really did need to develop a new screening tool to fit the needs of um, DARS and uh, Virginia citizens. And so um, we began working on that. And we worked with Patty Goodall and Donna Cantrell to identify some community agencies that would participate with us in a pilot study. We worked on the methodology and we began um, a process of the Institutional Review Board here at UVA. So um, with the help of Patty and Donna, we did identify nine pilot sites across Virginia who agreed to participate with us. So we had three area agencies on aging, one Center for Independent Living, three community services boards, and then two free and charitable clinics. So that we then began developing questions, and this um, uh, was based on review of literature, reviewing other measures, um, and um, you know, Dr. Barth's experience, my experience, and we really, you know, really worked on a pool of questions. Um, and then we also tried to figure out, well, how to get a sense of not just who had a history of these things, but who felt that they had symptoms currently that they tied to those um, issues. So we started working on some, uh, some of the items and the, the phrasing, and um, our participating agencies gave us feedback on things ranging from the demographic questions to how items were phrased. And this was so exceptionally helpful because their questions um, really helped us understand the difference between, you know, perhaps we were phrasing things coming from a background of uh, brain injury experience and they had a different area of expertise. And so this was incredibly valuable to us. Um, so we kept revising uh, the BBIST. And then we also had it reviewed by two brain injury experts, um, Dr. Giuliano at UMass and Dr. Um, Erico who is a qualified uh, brain injury support provider and has worked with the uh, um, uh, Institute in New England. And so after 10 revisions, the current VBIST was finalized. So we submitted um, the final VBIST and the entire protocol for review at UVA to the IRB. And of course, um, as with most studies, it required consent for agency clients. Our concern, however, was we did not want the consent process to be so onerous that it was a burden to agency staff because we were really asking a lot of these agencies to try out this measure to see if it would provide helpful information. Um, so the UVA um, IRB, after reviewing the consent form and seeing um, the consent form and the measure, how minimally um, invasive it was and that every response would be de-identified, nothing would be linked to any agency client, allowed us to use verbal consent. So when we provided training to the various agencies, um, they, uh, we really stressed the importance of the consent process and um, I will show you that consent process shortly. So we then um, presented two webinars with our pilot agencies, and those were not only the directors, but anybody that they thought would be involved in participating in this process. And we just reviewed the consenting process for the client. We reviewed the VBIS, and uh, we developed an electronic survey system. Um, because again, we were trying to make this as minimally um, uh, intrusive for the staff as possible. So. Um, all staff were able to enter client responses electronically, either through an iPhone or a computer, and it was very easy to just click and uh, respond to items. Um, you'll see that we had one little glitch because there was one question that required typing in text. Um, 
but um, otherwise it was a very easy to use system. And then we also developed uh, or just had a paper version available because some of these agencies were in either remote areas or they would go out to meet clients at their home or in other remote areas where there was not a Wi-Fi or web access. So for some of our agencies, they said, no, we just need to do paper. So those responses were faxed to us here or mailed to us, and then we entered the data ourselves into the Qualtrics system. So we started data collection on August 8th and uh, collected data for six months. And then um, this is um, what I want to show you now. Like This is really the, the part of the webinar that we did, but it will show you the VBIS, but also I just did want everybody to see the consent process um, to feel comfortable with how we capture this data. So um, we did stress, and we really stress this on the webinar, that it's optional for clients to participate and answer the questions. And we really wanted to be sure that the agency personnel um, acknowledge that the client is receiving services from the agency. So we did not want any client to feel sort of like implicitly coerced to participate. So we really stress that because the client was receiving services, um, that, that the client completely feel able to decline participation and stop at any point. And we said if the client even seems hesitant to participate, do not proceed. We only wanted um, clients who were very comfortable proceeding to participate in this pilot study. And then here was the uh, verbal consenting process. So the agency personnel read the purpose of the research study, which is to specify that it's a screening process to identify clients who might have experienced a TBI or ABI, and that it's a short screening tool, and that we just want to know more about how easy it is for the provider to use the tool. And then we um, had them read that um, participation involved answering a few questions about their medical history, that they could skip any questions they didn't want to answer, they could stop at any time. Uh, that we did not collect their name or identifying information, and we only collected age and gender, and that the responses would be entered into a database and summarized by agency. Um, and we emphasized that the study would only take about five minutes of your time, and ironically, I think the consent process took longer than the actual VBIS, um, but uh, also there were no anticipated risks and no direct benefits to the clients participating. Um, it's just the goal of increasing knowledge of clients who might have these injuries and might need additional services. So um, again, we emphasize confidentiality, that participation is voluntary, they could withdraw, and how they could withdraw, that they would not receive payment, and then they were asked if they agreed to participate. And each um, client who participated also got a piece of paper that had my name and contact information and the name and contact information of the head of the um, Social and Behavioral Sciences IRB um, director here at UVA, just in case they had any concerns at all about how the study was um, conducted. So then we went through the VBIST, and you can see this version has the agency type and agency study identifier on it. We did collect data um, by agency type, uh, such as area agencies on aging, uh, the SILs, the CSBs, and the, the uh, free clinics. And then we had an identifier for each individual agency. Um, we did offer to each agency that we would provide their specific data to them to help them understand more about their clients. Again, nothing about any individual participant, but just their, their individual agency data. Um, and so this is it. This is a very simple screening tool. So um, just captured age and then um, self-identified gender and then simply ask them if they've ever had a traumatic brain injury. And if a client said, what's a traumatic brain injury, um, the agency staff were asked to really read that definition up at the top. And the client simply responded yes or no. And if it's no, they skipped to the next question. If they said yes, they were asked what caused the injury. Um, and you can see the mechanisms down there, so falls, uh, motor vehicle accidents, bicycle accidents, et cetera. And then, um, there was an option, um, text boxes to type in other mechanisms of injury, or some people had multiple mechanisms of injury that got typed in. So then we asked if they were knocked out, unconscious or in a coma, yes, no, 
And if yes, for how long? Um, 1 to 30 minutes, 31 to 60, and more than 60, because we really wanted to get a sense of, you know, milder injuries versus more significant injuries. Um, and um, we, I think we got some very interesting data with that. And then the second question is simply, have you ever had any kind of other brain condition event or disorder diagnosed by a doctor, such as any of the following? And again, it's a list of more, um, more frequent neurologic um, insults, including stroke, seizures, um, anoxia, brain infections, brain tumor, and then dementia. And because many people um, confuse Alzheimer's as something different than dementia, we specify that this includes dementia and other types of dementia. Uh, actually, this includes Alzheimer's and other types of dementia. So if, if uh, individuals said no there, then that's the end. That was the end of the questionnaire. As you can see, there's a big stop sign there. Um, but if they responded yes, then we went to page two. And the, the client was asked, do you currently have any problems or issues with your thinking from this brain injury condition event or disorder? Um, yes or no. And if yes, they were asked to indicate which category it fell into. And we listed um, some different cognitive domains that are commonly affected. So then we asked if they have any physical problems or issues from the brain injury condition event or disorder. Um, yes, no, and again listed a long uh, list of various kinds of physical symptoms that people may have that may persist after neurologic insult. And then lastly, do you currently have any emotional problems or issues that you think are due to your brain injury condition, event, or disorder, yes or no? And then again listed a variety of symptoms uh, that are um, relatively typical after um, neurologic issues, including depression, um, suicidal ideation or attempt, anxiety, PTSD, et cetera. And so that's the end of the VBIST. It is a very short screener. And um, what I'll show you in the next few slides, I'm going to show you a resource slide first, but then I'm going to show you the data that we received um, in our pilot study, which we think shows that this actually even though, again, for those of you who work in, uh, very intensely um, with individuals with brain injury, this may seem super simple, overly simple, we actually found that it provided us with very helpful information from these agency clients because, again, they're not typically screened for history of TBI or ABI in this way. Um, so during the webinar um, for our pilot sites, um, because they were asking and identifying individuals who may have had a significant TBI or ABI, um, we wanted to provide them with some resources. So we worked with um, Patty uh, Goodall and Donna Cantrell to develop a list of resources, and it just, just shows the very top of it. Um, but we really um, uh, provided information um, about various resources in different geographic areas, and as you can see at the top there is BIAV, um, but we provided the geographic um, brain injury services, and then at the end also provided contact uh, for DARS if none of those um, geographic regions uh, were helpful or pertinent um, to where that client was located. Okay, so now we're going to switch gears, and uh, I'm going to just go over the data with you. So. Um, we were so pleased that we had um, 409 uh, clients consent to participate. So 542 were approached about participating, and 133 declined participation. So we were actually very happy to see this because it made us feel comfortable that clients did feel that they could very comfortably decline to participate without problem. Um, but we had a 75% participation rate, which is we felt like very strong, um, and so we were very pleased that we had 409 consent to participate. And as we go through the data, there's some questions where we only had 408 answers, but again, we had stressed that clients could choose not to um, answer any question they didn't want to, um, so that was not um, unexpected. I also just wanted to say that this is very close to final data um, our data collection period is completed. That ended in February, as I mentioned. 
but we're still doing a final check of data integrity. So I don't want to say that this is the final, final results yet, but I anticipate that this, if it's not final, it's very, very close to final. So when we looked at the participation rate by agency type, again, we had such um, strong participation. Um, and as you can see, the vast majority of our respondents came from the CSBs, um, which was extremely helpful to us because that's sort of a very broad um, service provider. But 88% um, of our uh, area agencies on aging per participated, 100% from still, um, 12 clients participated and nobody declined. 73% um, of those approached at the CSBs agreed to participate, and then um, we had 84% um, participation from the free and charitable clinic. So in terms of gender, um, the sample was predominantly um, self-identified as female, with 57% female, 41% male, and then uh, we had some individuals self-identifying in um, various other categories. Um, so we felt like we got a pretty good representation of gender. And then um, age was probably our biggest puzzle. So if you um, look at the data on top um, in the table, that is our current data. And it, it lines up very nicely with what you would expect. We would, of course, expect the clients in the area agency on aging to be an older population. And in fact, they are. Uh, there was a median age of 80. Um, the median age of the SILs was 57, the median age of the CSB was 40, and the median age of the free and charitable clinics was 30. So we really had a good age distribution. The, the challenge that we were trying to figure out is that, um, as I mentioned, age was the only um, uh, important data variable um, other than just kind of free text um, for mechanisms of injury where the, there had to be data entry. And we found 20 ages that were out of range. So this study was designed for adults 18 and up. And um, we found some ages that were listed as like age four, age 10. And so uh, we were concerned because we also didn't think these agencies served um, younger populations. And so we did contact the three agencies um, Two, we think, were definitely data entry errors based on talking to those programs. And then there was one agency that had, um, I think, 18 of the out of range. And um, what we think happened there is because the clients were primed on that this is a brain injury or an ABI, um, TBI, ABI study all throughout the consenting process, we, we, are, we believe that at that one site, some of the clients um, were instructed to give the age at which their injury occurred. So again, we've been contacting the centers and really trying to do due diligence. We have been assured that nobody under the age of 18 was enrolled in the study. Um, so what we did is we just deleted those data variables that were below the age of 18 so we could accurately capture age, but we kept their other responses again after consulting um, with those agencies. So in terms of our total sample responses, and I just also want to say very briefly that, that one of the things that was very important to us is we did not want to capture such a broad net that we, we captured a lot of people who might have had very, very mild injuries, and, and that was a concern expressed um, to us that we wanted to get a sense of who had a significant injury enough that they may still have current symptoms that need addressing. And so um, when we asked, have you ever had a traumatic brain injury? Yes, um, 104 people said that they had, and 304 said no. So this helped us feel comfortable that people, um, we were not sort of just catching such a broad net that they were grabbing everybody and it was not um, specifically identifying the population of interest. So 25% said they had. And of those, interestingly, 41% um, um, of the area agencies on aging. So of those asked who participated, 
at the Area Agency on Aging, 41% said they had had a TBI. And if you remember, this is a much older population. Um, and so it may be that they had injuries um, when they were younger that were just were really never recorded or picked up or passed along before people were quite as aware of the importance of asking about um, brain injury. So we had just one individual in the cell and 75 people, which is 23% of their population with CSB, and then 13 individuals, which was 35% of the respondents from the free and charitable clinic. And in terms of what caused the TBI, um, these are ordered in terms of frequency. So the vast majority received their um, injury from a car accident or a fall. And then 16% um, were hit with a um, heavy object, pedestrian hit by a car, 5%. Sports or recreational activity was 4%. Bicycle, 3%. Partner violence, 2%. And we had one individual um, who reported being exposed to uh, blast forces in the military. So then in terms of other mechanisms of injury, and this was a free, uh, that sort of other category that you saw, and in the Qualtrics survey, this was a free text box. So the agency provider could just type in um, anything um, provided by the client. And so some of the other responses that were typed in, um, there were probably two to three references to some form of parental abuse, um, assault that involved not being hit with an object, but being thrown down the stairs or punched or things like that. Um, um, items falling on top of somebody's head. One individual reported falling out of a crib as an infant, and then there were others who had written in uh, the other box, you know, multiple injuries. So like a combination of fight, fall, uh, blunt trauma, and things like that. So again, I thought, this was very helpful that it did give us a sense that, again, motor vehicle collisions are a major contributor to brain injury, um, as well as falls, and then um, you know, a variety of other mechanisms of injury. So in terms of the severity where you knocked out, 64% um, out of the 104 who reported a TBI said yes. And um, regarding the length of um, unconsciousness, about Almost half said one to 30 minutes, um, a few said 31 to 60 minutes, and then a very significant number said more than 60 minutes. So again, a pretty significant TBI. And when we asked about whether they had ever had any other kind of brain condition, event, or disorder diagnosed by a doctor, such as any of the following, um, this was our data. And so interestingly, seizures was, um, the, uh, the highest category, so 34 people indicated uh, having seizures, 4% um, had stroke, 3% dementia, um, 4 people reported loss of oxygen to the brain, uh, 3 people brain tumors, um, other category, uh, there were 3 responses, nobody reported a brain infection, and 82% um, of the sample said, no, I've never had any of these things, so again, we felt like this um, measure was capturing individuals who had a rather significant issue, but not um, capturing people, um, you know, a, a very large, large uh, group of people. So if we look at ABI by agency, I think this is very interesting because this really gave us some information, which I hope will be helpful to DARS and um, other providers in terms of who is providing services to some of these. Um, individuals. So with stroke, uh, the vast majority of individuals who self-identified as having a history of stroke were being seen in the CSB. And um, the next uh, was the Area Agency on Aging, with Phil and Free and Charitable Clinic also providing, seeing a few of these. But you can see CSB seeing most of these uh, individuals and then the aging agencies uh, next. And then with seizures, um, it's the CSB again, 91% of individuals who reported having seizures um, were in our CSBs, and I'm assuming um, the CSBs are, you know, actively involved in really um, helping with uh, managing um, their seizure activity. Um, and the free and charitable clinics was 9% um, with very, very minimal response in the other agencies. And then the category of dementia 
as you might expect, um, we have the Area Agency on Aging um, providing services to 69% of those who reported um, some diagnosis of dementia, and then the CSB um, was next with 31%. So then, uh, if you recall from looking at the VBEST, we really wanted to know if individuals had current symptoms that they themselves identified as related to their history of TBI or ABI. So we asked, do you currently have any problems or issues with your thinking um, from the brain injury condition, event, or disorder? And again, this is back to the total sample. And a little over half said yes, and a little over half said, or excuse me, a little under half said no. Um, and when we asked about their current cognitive problem, the results were actually very astounding to me and Dr. Barth. Um, we thought we'd see a, a large variety of symptoms endorsed, but 93% reported that their problem was with memory. Um, so, um, and remember, this is mostly individuals with TBI because the vast majority of individuals who reported a problem reported a TBI um, with fewer individuals reporting um, seizures, stroke, dementia, and, and other neurologic issues. Those who filled out the other box reported vertigo, spacing out, which is in fact an attention problem, but they did not interpret it that way, uh, racing thoughts, um, which is uh, maybe related to uh, more emotional um, challenges, and then headaches, um, which actually would fit into our physical um, symptoms category. But nonetheless, I think this is really important um, to know about these um, clients and agencies because um, if these clients are really having that amount of significant difficulty with their memory, it really goes to the importance of giving written information to clients, um, prompting them with phone calls or reminders about appointments or um, making sure they have some kind of props or structure in place in their daily life about taking medications, um, because this is clearly seems to be a very big area of concern for these individuals. Um, and then symptoms that were not endorsed by any participant in this category were attention concentration, except for the one who endorsed spacing out, language, problem solving, and multitasking. So we then asked about physical problems. Do you currently have any physical problems or issues um, from this brain injury condition, event, or disorder? 38% um, said yes, and 62% said no. And I'm, I'm rather baffled by um, the response we got, which again, predominantly clustered around one symptom. Um, and the current problem and physical problem endorsed by uh, overwhelming majority was nausea, so 93%. And um, what I'm wondering if the nausea is potentially related um, to a medication side effect. So some of the individuals, some of the medications they may be taking, um, um, because I, I'm not quite sure um, specifically how that might tie to some of the neurologic issues reported. Um, and then, the other symptoms written into the text box included weakness over right eye, difficulty with speech, uh, which could be cognitive, but can also be more of a kind of a motor um, challenge, neuropathy, and then worsened eyesight. So um, the problems that were not endorsed by any participant that they tied to the neurologic injury or uh, insult were things like fatigue, imbalance, trouble with vision or hearing other than the um, symptoms reported in the other box, um, headaches, various kinds of pain, light and sound sensitivity, and difficulty with sleep. So we then asked about their current emotional problems. Um, do you currently have any emotional problems or issues that you think are due to your brain injury, um, condition, event, or disorder? And about 40% said yes, 60% said no, and again, we had one clear uh, response that the vast majority endorsed. Um, and um, what you can see is we were particularly interested um, in seeing um, not only in our total sample, but also within the CSB, um, how many might have endorsed this, because given that CSB is managing a lot of um, clients with emotional challenges, we wanted to see there. But again, this, 
this gave us some faith in this tool because 66% um, said, no, I do not tie my current emotional problems to that neurologic injury, um, but a third of the sample did. And the vast majority endorsed depression as their symptom that they tied to that uh, neurologic issue with only 4% um, endorsing other symptoms. So again, if we look at symptoms not endorsed, uh, suicide, anxiety, PTSD, the short fuse that's so common after brain injury, uh, hallucinations, difficulty trusting others. Uh, but the two responses were written in, and one was about um, uh, feeling afraid to sexually interact, and the other was actually very positive. I used to be depressed, but not anymore. So um, we then... Um, wanted to really get a sense of how easy or not was this questionnaire to use in these agencies. Because again, when we did the training, um, our pilot agencies really expressed concerns about how much, how onerous the intake process was and just how busy all their providers are. And so we really tried, again, to make the VBIS very concise but, but helpful and to provide helpful information. So we really want to know what the agency personnel thought about the VBIS. So we, we developed a survey, again, using Qualtrics, so we could send a link to these providers um, to get their confidential responses on what they thought of the VBIS. And again, we wanted their perspective on how easy it was or not to use the VBIS in their agency setting. So we asked super simple questions, and the first one was the VBIS is easy to use, and we were very happy to see these results. So 36% um, strongly agreed, 55% agreed, 9% were neutral, and nobody disagreed or strongly disagreed. And then we asked um, about whether it was quick to administer. And again, as you can see, the vast majority agreed or strongly agreed um, with 27% uh, neutral and nobody um, disagreeing. And we then asked, um, the VBIS will be easy to incorporate into the standard intake evaluation. And here you can see some disagree. So 18% said strongly agree, 45% agree, a number were neutral. And then we see our first disagree show up. And again, I think this just reflects um, how much information these agency providers are trying to capture um, on their clients. And so adding any one thing can make it a bit more of a challenge for them. So uh, we asked about whether they perceived the VBIS as a good way to gather and organize brain injury intake information. And again, um, very strong agreement rate, 9% um, neutral, 9% disagree, and nobody strongly disagreeing. And um, then we asked about uh, whether the VBIS provides information which would help them consider additional brain injury services for their clients. And um, a uh, again, a vast majority agreed. 36% were neutral, so a little over a third were neutral, but no, nobody strongly disagreeing. Um, and so then additional comments that we um, were typed into the text box, and this first one we actually really, really were happy to see this one. Uh, I love this survey, which was very nice to hear. Um, and again, we'd had some feedback um, outside of the survey from the client, uh, the agency providers as well, that they really liked that it was so succinct, um, and yet that they felt that they got some helpful information. And then the next comment really goes to the point um, that I was making about how incredibly busy these providers are. Uh, actually, um, not this one, it's the last one. I was glad to participate uh, in the trial. And then the last one is our intake process of clients is lengthy, and health coaches sometimes feel overwhelmed with paperwork. Adding this extra component provided some pushback from employees. And so again, I think this goes to the rationale for why we work so hard to develop such a concise measure. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, there are plenty of very detailed, um, clinically rich measures in the literature, um, and those would have just been so overwhelming for our agency providers. And so even though the VBIS was designed to be very, very targeted, um, it still caused some pushback in some agencies because it was just one more thing. 
So our next and final steps are to keep checking our data for any obvious data entry errors, um, finalize our data analysis, and then we also plan to work with DARS and uh, actually BIAB to develop some recommendations for agencies who identify clients with current problems. So if a client identifies a current problem related to a TBI or ABI, uh, what is the next step? To whom should that client be referred for um, either for further evaluation or resources? Um, we want to um, finalize kind of a very brief training manual for use with, use with the VBIS and then prepare our final report and the individual reports for each agency. Um, and then again, this kind of goes uh, just a repeat of our project goals, and I feel like um, the VBIS did turn out to be brief, easy to administer, um, it didn't require a lot of training, and it did provide some very helpful information um, about a history, self-reported history of TBI or ABI and um, those who might have symptoms current, rela currently related. Um, and um, I just want to give a very big um, uh, shout out to our participating agencies. They were absolutely wonderful. So again, they helped us with various revisions of the VBIS, um, telling us to change wording or some of the questions we were asking. They were on our training webinar and they took their time to train their staff and administer this and check in with us and let us know when they were encountering any technical difficulties. They were absolutely wonderful. And then I also want to thank uh, Jessica James uh, and Matthew Osborne, who work with me here uh, at UVA. Um, Jessica entered uh, a lot of the faxed paper VBIS entries, and uh, Matthew uh, assisted with that as well, and also has been working with me on data analysis. So um, I really appreciate um, all those who assisted, including um, Patty Goodall and Donna Cantrell and um, the Commonwealth Neurotrauma Initiative. So I'm happy to take a few questions uh, at this point. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Brushek. Um, we had a couple comments and I sent one regarding just a question re um, in reference to the attributions. I don't know if you wanna look at that, I sent it to you. Okay. And then um, also comment that um, Recommendations for follow-up referrals and resources will also be provided to screeners in the area of dementia services. So that's primarily for the AAA screeners. Sure, so um, thank you to the individual who, um, so yes, it is Dr. Wayne Gordon, um, and you are correct. Um, so Mount Sinai School of Medicine should be the correct attribution and um, um, I'm not sure if uh, the Wayne State University was uh, um, my own brain cramp based on his first name being Wayne or exactly what happened there, but um, we will double check our references on that and correct that. So thank you um, very much for that. Yeah, somebody just commented okay. that they thought um, the attribution had a slight error, that it was an attribution to Dr. Wayne Gordon at Brain Injury Services Research Center at Mount Sinai. Yes, thank you so much. That's um, very helpful. And then the question was, um, Debbie said whether or not there would be resources provided um, for the individuals with dementia? Well, it's actually a, just a comment that they will be. The follow-up referral resources also will be provided to screeners um, in the area. Correct. Yeah. Exactly, just so people Correct. knew that that was going to be there. Um, Correct. And the, um, we have another question. Can you remind us of the validity and reliability significance? So one of the things I really want to be clear on, so this study was not validated against any kind of chart review, so we do not have reliability and validity statistics on this. And we actually, the version of this that's posted um, on the DARS website makes very clear on the home page that this was not um, validated against, you know, physician diagnosis, neuropsychologist diagnosis, medical chart review, and again, because that was not um, the purpose of this study, um, certainly that would be valuable to do at some point, and um, I think that's extremely important um, because as a neuropsychologist, I look at the reliability and validity of psychometric measures all the time. However, this was designed to be a screening tool um, for use in these community agencies. And I think um, 
what we found was very helpful in looking at these data was that it did seem to identify a relatively small subset of individuals who were endorsing this um, having a neurologic injury that they themselves tied to current symptoms that might benefit from further follow-up and evaluation. And so I think that is really what's just so important is to really raise awareness of asking about TBI or ABI in these agencies that are not designated as, you know, quote, brain injury services providers. Um, again, to raise awareness and to help clients um, really be able to um, to talk to a provider and uh, potentially receive some additional services. Um, and when we talked about this um, at a at a previous um, meeting, one of the issues that was coming up is that people just sometimes just don't even ask about brain injury. And so this gives um, agency providers a way to just have that um, either conversation or even very brief questioning about it, um, again, to, to raise awareness and potentially identify services. But this, this is not a psychometric tool with, um, uh, that was validated against other measures. And there's a significant literature on um, the issues of, you know, uh, trying to get self-reported history from individuals. Um, so, you know, that's certainly an area um, uh, of research. And again, this was just developed to be a community agency screening tool. Great. Okay. And we have one more question about, um, is there a particular reason why you didn't ask about concussion as the cause of the brain injury, just with all the concerns about um, long-term problems and symptoms regarding concussion? Absolutely. We very specifically talked about um, traumatic brain injury, which includes mild traumatic brain injury, and we did not want to use concussion. Um, concussion um, in, the, in the field is generally considered to be the mildest form of mild traumatic brain injury, and there are many, many, many people who have, ha have a history of concussion, um, and concussion in general is considered more of a transient neurologic event. Uh, most people recover from concussion. Um, of course, there's the issue of people who may have had multiple concussions and potentially have some long-lasting symptoms. But again, in trying to meet the needs of what we were asked to do and the needs of community agencies, we did not want to cast such a broad net that we brought in a whole lot of individuals. Um, if I asked, and I have, many of my colleagues here at UVA, providers and uh, my colleagues in uh, working in sports neuropsychology, a lot of people have had concussions, and we did not want this measure to be so so broad that we would capture a lot of people and then um, have the agencies trying to figure out what to, to make discrimination. So we intentionally used the word traumatic brain injury, including those with and without loss of consciousness, so that encapsulates individuals who had a mild TBI. Um, but that, but that's specifically why we did not use the term concussion. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I also want to say to Miss M, she had a, a question, um, and it looks like something that maybe um, the Brain Injury Association of Virginia could help her with. So I'm going to put our 1-800 number in the, um, I'm going to chat it to the whole group. So if somebody has something that's more um, in involved that we can get back with them about that. And we also have somebody that asked about, do you think this might work with children under 18? So um, that's an excellent question. And that uh, actually came up when we talked um, or presented preliminary data at the Virginia Brain Injury Council. And so this was not developed for kids under 18. And um, it was actually developed for providers to ask clients. So, but when it came up at the VBIC, one of the questions was like, wow, this would be really helpful in schools. Um, so for those of you working in the school system, what I think you could potentially do is just look at these questions and see if they are captured um, on your medical intake form uh, for students. Because um, again, at the VBIC, the question came up about um, that this would be very helpful and that sometimes schools don't know this information. And so um, 
you know, we don't have a uh, pediatric version of this tool, but I think, um, you know, reviewing, again, your medical intake questionnaires and seeing if the parents can be, you know, asked about whether there's any history of, you know, TBI or um, seizures or even, you know, developmental strokes, things like that, um, to, to get that information to, to school personnel. Okay, great. We have time for one last question, and it is, did the agencies reach out to all clients or were they specifically selected as far as who participated? So, wait, that's an excellent question. So, it really varied. So, what we asked um, agency personnel is to um, try to incorporate this into every new intake. So um, we did not ask them to be selective in any way, and we have no, I, no way to know if, if within the agency they were selective. But we said we really just wanted every new intake to be asked these questions if possible. Um, and so the vast majority of agencies indicated that's how they used it. They just folded it into their typical intake routine. Um, and then I think uh, one of the agencies, one or two perhaps, indicated that they were asking some of their clients that they were just following um, just because they were just, you know, they themselves were curious and started asking clients as they were um, coming in about this history. But that's a great question. Thank you. Yes, excellent. Okay, Dr. Burchett, thank you so much for presenting this and um, thank you everyone for joining us. And just a quick reminder, if you need a um, certificate of attendance, you can download that real quick under the handouts section and we will um, have a copy of the PowerPoint along with this um, webinar recording available on the Brain Injury Association of Virginia website, um, hopefully within a week. So thank you so much, everybody, and um, have a good afternoon. Thank you, everybody.